This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 69. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak, brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. Your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment related columns, contests, features, reviews, news, resources, and more. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Jamie D. I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> and welcome to the show. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by E. Gerber Products, the industry leader in long term storage sleeves for your collection. Visit them on the web at www.egerber.com. That's E-G-E-R-B-E-R.com. E-Gerber Products, the protector for the collector. I got to tell you, we met this guy in Baltimore. This is the Mylar guy. And to, what is it, Vince? My Lights. Yeah, My Light. They, their product line is called My Lights. Right. And it, it's, it's Vince, right, in, in, uh, up on in Pennsylvania forum. on the forum. And uh, like only it was only like two weeks before the the convention he was preaching about mylars and i'm like no nah, no no mylars then i went to the convention and they have a booth and they're like here take a sample take a sample and i was talking to the guy for a while i said i gotta tell you i i don't you know they're all crinkly he says well it, we used to be crinkly they used to have one mil mylars and they're very crinkly and he said you know what people hate them we got all complaints about them all the time and he took one he crumpled his hand it was all crinkly made a hell of a lot of noise and he just threw it over his shoulder he's like these suck we just came out with new, it's like one, one and a half mil Mylars. And they were thin, but they were not, they were a little crinkly, I mean, but they're not anywhere close to that one mil yeah. crinkly stuff. And Shane's standing there, <laughs> and we're hearing his spiel about how they protect for life, and they never yellow comics. And he has an example of books that were put in like six years ago in a regular bag and in a Mylar. And the Mylar's crystal white, and the the poly bag is all yellowed and everything. And I'm like, oh, boy. Yeah. And, then he, and then he's showing us the thicker ones, the two mil, the and four the four mil. mil. Oh. And it's like you can't bend it with a Sherman tank, you know. It's so stiff. And it's like, oh. Oh, the four mil. So Shane and I both ended up buying. Uh, the two mil ones, yep. and I'm like, I'm putting my grooves in mylars because they're so. It just they look so nice. They're crystal clear. They, you know, it's just like I'm not gonna go nuts. Like Vince buys them for every one of his books, but I'm just gonna do like my favorite run grew. But they are nice products. I'd, I'd like to say I'm only gonna stick with Justice League, but I'm gonna start filtering backwards slowly. So you know, eventually my yeah. first order is gonna be. Probably five hundred or so. <laughs> so you, you, well, you you've know, I've never also, been the king of self control <laughs> No, no, no. But but also, I'm like a hundred and fifty issues behind because I ran out of bags and boards before. So, you know, if I'm going to start, I'll just start now and just every now and then just get a hundred here, a hundred there, and just slowly do it. Not going to go crazy doing all, you know, five thousand at one shot. Just slowly but surely get it all done they over look. time. Yeah, well, I have to admit they do. I saw it. Too. You were you were yeah, tempted for your titan. Oh, you were even man, talking about titans. maybe for your titans yeah. run. And for me, like I, I hope one of my boys takes an interest in comics to take over this collection at some point. And these things protect for like a hundred years. I mean, the, you know, it's great. It's perfect. And, and we did talk about on the show how about every so often you have to go and replace all yeah. your bags and bo- or at least your bags. And you I'm know? well overdue for for my stuff from when so, I did it back in '93. Like right? Yeah. You, yeah if you spend a little these. extra at once and and. I'm not pimping them just because they're paying us. I'm pimping them because I like. Yeah. I'm con- after ten minutes of talking to that guy, I was completely sold on the fact that I need to put some of my books in yeah. Mylar's. I'm going to start with Justice League and some of the current stuff that I don't have bagged, and then just go backwards from there. Eventually. And DCBS carries My Lights too. And in fact, yeah. you can get your monthly books in mm-hmm. My Lights. It's fifty cents a pop versus ten okay. cents for the for the regular Holly books bags. Uh, for the regular bags but uh but you don't you don't even need a board for these right no, if not really. you, especially if you got the 4, four mil yeah. you would mm-hmm. not need a board because they're so stiff and and that's one thing he said, said that don't let anybody tell you different the board is there for rigidity yeah and he said he said the same thing he said the the one and a half mil and the four mil give you the exact same amount of protection. It's yeah. just that the four mil is rigid. Yep. So you don't need to spend extra money on boards on the fatter bags. Uh, if you if you're worried about preserving the comic yep. because that's just for rigidity, so it was cool. Yeah, it was yeah. it was a good talk. It, it and and I had no knowledge of of my lights at all or my Lars. It was it was good information. Yeah. He converted us. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that's hard to do too. So check him out. What's that website again? Egerber.com. Um, 
Well, for this episode, I am so pleased to announce that we have an interview with my the guy, one of the men responsible for getting me into comics, and that's Mark Evanier, the writer of Gru, among many, many, many other things. When when you told me we got this interview, I was very excited too, Brian. I I, I love I've loved his uh, point of view um, columns in uh, CBG. Yeah. So without further ado. Uh, here's Mark. Hello, Mark. Yes, sir. All right. Welcome to the show. Uh, with me is Shane, Jamie, and Peter. Shane, Jamie, and Peter. I'll remember this by the time we're done. <laughs> okay. That's that's more than most people say. They just they admit that they'll never remember. All right. <laughs> so, Mark, the first question uh, that we like to ask is, how did you first start reading comics? I don't know. I think the doctor slapped me when I was delivered, and they dro- I dropped a copy of Walt Disney's Comics and Stories. <laughs> I have been reading comics my entire life. I can never remember a time when I didn't have more than anyone I knew. Uh, my parents were enormously generous with them. They were generous with anything I wanted to read. My father, my father was a voracious reader, and he liked the idea of me reading. And I suspect if I'd started reading comic books at age nine, he might not have been as as uh, benevolent towards it as the fact that I started reading them when I was about three or four. And, you know, for three or four, that's pretty good if the kids can hold a, a book up and, and look at I'm gesturing like you can see me. Uh, <laughs> if the kid can, can actually read the thing. And I uh, had uh, very advanced language skills. By the time I got to school, I was a couple of grades ahead of the norm in reading. I was I was... To, to make up for it, I was deficient in everything else. <laughs> but uh, when you know, when I was in kindergarten, they were, the teachers were telling my parents, "Your son reads like a third or fourth grader, and writes like a third or fourth grader," which you know is about where I am today, professionally also. But <laughs> so but you plateaued they, uh, early. <laughs> uh, you know, and so they figured, well, the comic books have have, have helped him get there, and um, so they kept buying them for me until I could afford to buy them myself. So yeah, I've been reading them my whole life. And uh, as you as you graduated from, well, let me ask you this: Did you did you get into superhero books after the Walt Disney stuff? Well, I started off with you know the Walt Disney stuff and the Warner Brothers stuff and all those. And then when I was about uh, eight or nine, I did one of the stupider things I've done in a life with many contenders, and I traded them all in for superhero comics. It was a local secondhand bookshop that would give you two for one credit for comics. So I I traded in all those wonderful Disney comics for action comics. And then, you know, years later, I had to buy back the, the Karl Barks comics at inflated prices. So, uh, but, um, yeah, I graduated to the superhero stuff around age eight or nine or something like that. And, and for some reason, I made the error of thinking that was more sophisticated. So uh, you're, are you telling us that you're not a super enthusiastic superhero fan? No, I just, I just think that, you know, the high watermark of comics... You know, might be Fox and Crow. <laughs> it's just, I, I like uh, I like everything. I really do. I just I just uh, uh, I read everything. I, in in uh, my teen years, I I amassed a huge comic collection because in my teen years, I just basically bought everything. I think I didn't buy the Archies for a while in there, but I bought I bought all the Gold Keys. I bought all the the Dell comics. I bought all the DCs and Marvels. I bought Millie the Model. I bought everything that came out, and I enjoyed wow. everything to some extent. And I never. Uh, really felt that uh, one genre was uh, that preferable to another. When I was writing the Disney comics years later, and and the the you know, the Bugs Bunny comics and such, um, I would occasionally get the insensitive person who would say something to me like, you know, wouldn't you rather write something realistic like Thor? <laughs> and, I, and I would think, well, yeah, you know, a god of thunder. That's so much more realistic than a talking rabbit. <laughs> So let me uh, let me tell you uh, that it, it's it's due largely in part uh, to you and Sergio that I am a comic book fan today. Is the first comic you're that not, I ever. You're not going to pin that on us. I'm sorry. <laughs> we've we've done enough damage without without having, having that in our reputation. But the the first comic that I ever recall reading was I I believe it was Marvel's Grew number four, and from there you know the rest is history. Um, so I want to thank you personally for your contribution that is Gru, because I oh, love it. Okay. Good. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad it got you hooked. If, if, that, if that'll do it, that's fine. 
Um, I, I did want to ask you a question uh, concerning Gru. Uh, before I forget, is uh, in in Wizard World? Oh no, no, it was in San Diego. Jamie and I were in San Diego, and we sat in on the on the panel that you did with Sergio. And uh, you told us that you, they were going to be continuing the trade paperback series uh, of the Gru, and also reissuing the trades that have already come out. Is that is that information still that accurate? What I have been told, but I don't think anybody has actually pushed the button yet on that. It, it, that is the plan as of, as of last time we spoke. Okay, so there's no kind of dates or anything like that. It's no, actually, I, I've been a little delinquent in confirming that up, and so has Sergio. We've been we've been both been kind of swamped lately with different projects, and uh, I probably should call up and nag them to put that stuff on the schedule. Okay, I'll make a note. I'll make a note as we're sitting here talking. I didn't do that. Excellent. I would really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so. We we to uh, if you haven't listened to our show we we try to be very. F- I listened to a couple of them. I enjoyed them. Yeah. Oh, you did! Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Wow, well, that's that's always good to know. With the mom while I was sitting here working. That seem we've gotten that from uh, several creators now. How it's, especially the artists, uh, the writers, and I mean the the pencilers and inkers and colorists because they you know they they don't have to concentrate on like a written word so they can hear stuff in the background and not get distracted yeah well if you've read my stuff you see i don't have to concentrate on the <laughs> <laughs> um but we just try to keep things very very loose and conversational as opposed to a you know very diligent uh um interview style question after question so if we pause for you know don't 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 fault us for being unprofessional no i, I won't <laughs> <laughs> this is uh this is peter um your DN agents run. Yes. Um, it was one of the first, uh, I don't want to say non-superhero books, but one of the first out of the big two Marvel and DC indie books that I ever read. Um, and it seemed to have uh, a, a, a volume and then a miniseries and then another volume. Um, were, were there just growing pains going through that whole series? Um, there were... Problems with the publisher. We were with a company called Eclipse Books, which was a very good publisher in some ways and not in others. And most of the not in other part, uh, when you deals when you're with a small publisher, they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of clout with the printers or the distributors. Um, there were problems sometimes getting paid for books that were sold. Uh, this happens at times, and and. Uh, uh, I enjoyed doing those comics. Uh, the, the main negative I had was just the, the problems of, of finances and, and budgeting and, and getting paid and things like that. It, it was it was uh, um, you have a it, it's a difficult uh, end of the business that I don't like, which is the, the business end, the distribution end, and such like that. And and I think the whatever changes and starts and stops you notice were mostly due to. You know, us waking up one morning and saying, "Gee, we haven't got paid for these issues that got, you know, bought eight months ago. We can't keep doing them uh, until we get some of the money in that we're owed." And uh, in that particular case, I, I financed. I kind of underwrote those books with my own my own money because uh, I enjoyed them and I wanted to keep the, keep doing them and keep them coming out. So I paid the artist myself, and then you know, the publisher would pay me back. And there were a few times when we had to stop production because. The publishers just didn't, just didn't have the money. At one point, the, the Eclipse books had a flood, and the entire city they were in was underwater, and they were they had most of their stock wiped out, and and that put a crimp in in their continuity of publishing. Also, for a while, it's tough being a small publisher. It, it, I, it, they always have trouble getting product out because uh, they have trouble getting paid. One of the recurring uh, topics on the show is the is the topic of uh, distribution and and direct sales and getting out into newsstands. Back in the early 80s, I assume indie books, the only option was direct sales, you know, comic yeah, shops? Yeah, that, that was the only uh, option they had. And there was, a, there was a little period of a few years there when just about anybody who could physically put together a comic book and get it to the printer could make a modest profit off it. We had a lot of new publishers springing up left and right. Uh, and many of them were uh, underfunded. Um, one of my pet uh, beefs, which I wrote about in an essay, which has been circulated all through the Internet, is sometimes you work for people who have just barely enough money to run their companies. 
or sometimes they don't have that. They're hoping to to kind of do the equivalent of check kiting. They're gonna they're gonna pay you when they get paid and, and move money around. And and uh, there were a lot of companies that were that were under. You, you need you need money to be a publisher. Uh, you don't need maybe need huge amounts of it, but that's what a publisher brings to the to a project. He brings the investment and. He has to have enough to cover contingencies. And so there was a period there, a number of years, where there were a number of people who could publish just barely. And if they were slow in getting paid, then everybody was slow in getting paid. And it was very difficult to uh, sustain. Um, a lot of companies sprung up that probably shouldn't have started. Uh, Eclipse was one of the better companies for a long time. And even they couldn't sustain in that market. Can I answer your, even rec- come even close to answering your question? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, because my ne- I was going to ask, if, if there was more of a newsstand's presence, would there have been more sales? But it seems like it probably still, you just needed money to get the books out there. No, the no, there was, there was uh, what happened was, you know, in the, in the, in the 650s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, the only way to sell a comic book was on newsstands. And the newsstand marketplace was rigidly controlled. The, 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 um, the companies that controlled it, mainly independent news, which was DC Comics and a few others, they didn't really let anybody else in. They, they wanted to keep it very finite. It was difficult to get distribution. There were a lot of people who tried to start comic book companies in the 60s, and they had enough money, but they did, what they didn't have was distribution. The, the, the existing distributors managed to block them out of the marketplace. Now, what happened in the late 60s and into the 70s, is, which is that the independent newsstand... Um, Set up started collapsing. Uh, newsstands started folding. There were many fewer newsstands. Of the ones that were left, fewer and fewer of them wanted to carry comics. And every year, there were simply less places for DC and Marvel and Gold Key and such to display their wares. And uh, we had a period in the early 70s when, when there were some very serious and, and not alarmist predictions that the comic book industry was going to come to an end because distribution was just getting worse and worse every year. And along came a man named Phil Suling, who is now deceased, but who kind of invented the direct distribution market. There were other people who deserved credit as well, but Phil was the, the main mover and shaker. And he said, look, we can sell these books directly to comic book shops and to dealers and bypass the, this newsstand setup. And that's what saved DC and Marvel. There would, there would probably not be a... Uh, a comic book industry today if, if somebody had not invented direct sales. Well, when they invented direct sales, it was all of a sudden now this means for other people to get in. And so Pacific Comics and First Comics and, and Eclipse Comics and you know, we, there's about a, there hundreds of companies suddenly now had this new distribution method that they were allowed into, whereas they could not have gotten into the previous setup. And uh, there is still newsstand distribution, but it doesn't really sustain the comics. It's more of a loss leader to publicize the books, get them out into uh, areas where there are no comic book shops. Um, you couldn't sustain a comic book company today on newsstand sales alone. Mark, I have a. Uh, I just uh, recently finished reading um, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book. Uh, and. There's a little story in there that includes you uh, about how, when you were uh, much younger, you you had the pleasure of meeting uh, Bob Kane. Meeting Bob Kane, yes, he was the uh, second person I ever met. Who did, for the, the the first person I ever met who did comics was a guy you'd never heard of before. But the second one was Bob Kane. Uh, the third was no, the second one was Jerry Siegel. The third one was Bob Kane, and the fourth one was Jack Kirby. Wow. I always say here here was like you know the co-creator of Superman, the co-creator of Batman, and the co-creator of everything else. <laughs> uh, yeah, I met Bob Kane when I was uh, I think 15 or 16, and um, not a very nice man. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what do you want to know about him? Well, I was gonna for for our audience, could you could you tell that story uh, about how you met him? I think it well, was fairly interesting. We had a comic book club. It was the Los Angeles Comic Book Club. I was the president. Of the, of the entire existence, which was about four or five years, and everybody in LA who was interested in comics came to our meetings. And one day, one of our members, a fellow named Herbert Robert, uh, is up at the Food Giant Market on Westwood Boulevard, which is no longer there. And he's looking at the comic book rack. And this guy comes up to him and says, "Hey, you like Batman?" 
and uh, Herbert thinks, who is this person? Yeah, I do. And the guy says, you know, uh, I'm Bob Kane. I'm the creator of Batman. And you know, Herbert's attitude is like, well, okay, I'm Robin the Boy Wonder. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but the guy it was Bob Kane, and he invited Herb to come up and see him. He was living out here. He was he was living on a, in a high rise over on Wilshire Boulevard. Very nice apartment. And he said to Herbert, uh, "Bring along some of your friends if you want." So Herbert brought about five of us up to meet Bob Kane. And because I was the uh, the most knowledgeable one about comic history, and I was like a year or two older than the rest of the gang, uh, I ended up doing most of the talking. And um, Bob invited me back later on my own. So he could talk to me more privately about comics. He felt uh, I, I, I would ask him questions about. Uh, uh, well, for, at that point, uh, they had not yet started crediting anybody on the Batman comics except him. He had his name on everything. There were no credits for anybody else. They Kane had not drawn a Batman story in more than 20 years. He had all these ghost artists who were doing them, but they maintained the fiction that he was drawing them. And I asked him. Uh, kind of uh, flat out, uh, how come, you know, in this comic, the art style looks different from this comic, and your name is on both of them? And he hemmed and hawed, and he finally admitted to me that he had, go he made it sound like the ghosts worked for him, which is not exactly true in all cases. Um, and, you know, he, 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 I knocked him off his typical stories. He had, he had these stories he would tell about how Batman was created and all these stories about who did what and how he sat up all night drawing these stories. And, you know, you, you throw a few facts at these guys, and all of a sudden they go, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> my, official, my official story doesn't work anymore. I've got to tell the truth. So he invited me up another, another day on my own, and he, he hauled out a bottle of vodka and drank about half of it and told me his life story. Um, and he started telling me all about... Uh, Dick Sprang and Sheldon Moldoff and all the guys who were really drawing the Batman. So it was, it was very. I wish I had a tape recorder. Um, it was. It was a. Uh, there. It was a fascinating afternoon. And, and I brought along with me at that at that um, second visit the new issue of Batman that had just come out, which was the first one with credits for somebody else. He Kane had had recently uh, uh, renegotiated his deal with DC. He had taken a buyout for some ownership interest he had. And as part of the buyout, he was no longer supplying uh, material to them through his studio. He was no longer employing ghosts who would do pages. DC was now hiring all the artists directly. And they were no longer obligated to the fiction that Bob Kane drew at all. So I showed him the new issue of Batman, which had a credit line on it for Irv Novick. And I just stood there as Bob Kane stared for the first time in his life, seeing somebody else's name on a Batman story. He, he, he knew it was coming. He was just not emotionally prepared to see it, and uh, it was very an interesting moment. He he was kind of had mixed emotions about it, but I he had, you know he had just taken a very big paycheck, so he, he didn't cry too much about it. And uh, in the re remaining years, I managed to run into him every year or two and remind him who I was and chat with him. And I, I just found him a fascinating man, which is which is not to say I, I I understood him, I think, but I don't think I respected him very much. Well, that was uh, interesting because uh, after reading that book, have you read that book, by the yeah, way? Jerry Jones's book, yes, yes. It's a wonderful book. It's called Men of Tomorrow. Is yes. The official name of it. It's an excellent book. Um, I have some quibbles with a few things, and I think, and, and Jerry and I have discussed them, and we're going to discuss them further when we get together. But it's really uh, a fascinating book, probably the most important book anyone's written about comics to date. And it, it, it's. You know, I don't want to say it's, uh, when I say it, I have a few quibbles with it. I don't want anybody to think it's not accurate. It is as accurate as any book that's ever been written about comics, maybe more so. Uh, there's some interpretations and arguments I have with, with a few points in it, but it's a wonderful book. The minute I read it, I called Jerry and just raved to, to his to his voicemail for about eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was real. I really enjoyed it, and and it was interesting shedding light on some of these people who, you know, as a comic fan. You're just oh well. Everyone knows who Bob Kane is, and everyone knows oh he's so cool because he created Batman. And then you find out well that's a little you know that's he didn't just create them all by himself. Bill Finger played a large role, and and some other people, and you know and and he was really a wheeler and dealer, and 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 is like you know he was not so nice maybe well, you know. In, in Mr. Kane's defense, uh, which and, and this is a maybe a half-hearted defense. 
what he did, what Cain did was what he had to, had to do or felt he had to do to get his reward. Uh, a lot of these guys used to talk about their reward. Harvey Kurtzman, who I interviewed once at great length, kept talking about how Mad Magazine had you know, made everybody associated with it a millionaire except him. And he said, how do I get my reward? I did this wonderful thing. How do, how do I get, and what means do I get paid? Well, what Cain did, which was claiming total creatorship of Batman and, and in many cases kind of negotiating against the self-interest, the interests of his collaborators, was what he felt he had to do. Now, that, doesn't, that doesn't excuse it necessarily, but, you know, you look at, this, at the history of comics, and there's an awful lot of geniuses and, and people who did wonderful work who weren't paid very well. And they were in a system that you, you could argue was corrupt, you could argue that it was not sophisticated and how it dealt with, it was not so sophisticated and mature in how it dealt with people. They hadn't kind of worked the kinks out of how to, how to reward their geniuses properly. But whatever it was, Kane did what he felt he had to do to make a living. And he made a very decent living off Batman and one which I think he deserved. The, 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 the salient point is not that he got so much it's that the other people didn't get anything. That Bill Finger, uh, who contributed so much, didn't get his reward. And I don't know that the, the proper way to look at it is to complain that Kane denied it to him so much as that the system did, and Kane just knew how to massage the system better. He was certainly a good businessman. you got to give him that. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I don't even know if businessman is the right word. I, do, I think he knew how to how to get money out of the system, how to analyze, how to jump in at the right moment, how to apply pressures. He had some, he had some very good luck. I mean, his, you know, he, had the, he made this deal around 1946, which paid him a lot of money for basically not doing anything for 20 years. And when the, that contract started to expire, Batman was hot again, because the TV show had just gone on. If Batman had not been a hot property then, he would have been on the, he would have had very little clout, but at that point, DC couldn't have afforded a lawsuit or any sort of big trouble with the, at least the nominal creator of Batman, so they paid him off again. And he made this 20-year deal, and by the time that one expired, Batman was hot again <laughs> with, with, with the Michael Keaton movies and such. And, and uh, once again, it was in DC's interest to just pay Kane off rather than to get into some sort of uh, you know, prolonged land sea war with him over the, the rights of the character or his, his participation in it. So he was lucky in a lot of cases, and he also was lucky in that um, he uh, started Batman very young, and he had uh, a father who knew a little bit about business. He was a little better informed than Siegel and Schuster about what he signed. Um, and, uh, you know, there are people who are just, you know, there's, it's possible in this world to have a skill for playing the clarinet and nothing else. And it's possible sometimes to have a skill for just, you know, getting I did money. Uh, I, I, I worked for, for some time with a, uh, for years with an executive at ABC, a vice president, senior vice president at ABC Television. And the people around him, and I, I, I said this, and everybody agreed, this man had one skill. He was good at not getting fired. That's all he could do. <laughs> he couldn't program or anything like that. But, you know, whenever something went wrong, somebody else got fired and he didn't. He lasted a long time there. Bob Kane was very good at exploiting a situation and, and, and grabbing whatever little money was on the table uh, in a narrow way. He wasn't great at drawing Batman or creating characters or, or envisioning great grand uh, fictional uh, concepts, which is why, you know, the last, the only one he ever did, he did when he was like, you know, 17 years old. Uh, but he was very good at... at uh, uh, manipulating a situation to his financial advantage. I don't know that I would call that being a good businessman. I think he's just, you know, really good at grabbing money. A wheeler and dealer, then. Yeah, something like that. Yes. So, Mark, let's talk a little bit about your uh, foray into cartoons, Dungeons Ooh, and Dragons, okay. and things like that. How All did right. you get started in in that area? In, in animation. Sure. Um, I. Uh, I started writing live action TV before I wrote animation. I I wanted to write animation. I had this strange idea that I could, you know, I was writing the Gold Key Comics for years. I was the most prolific writer that the West Coast Office of Gold Key Comics had in the early 70s. I was writing about seven comics a month for them. And I had this idea that I could somehow segue from that into writing for Hanna-Barbera or some studio like that, and that I could segue from that into live action television. But it didn't work that way. I started getting work in live action television, 
and uh, I couldn't get into animation. Uh, you know, there were these, all these things I wanted to do, and I, I couldn't quite do them in the right order, uh, or the desired order. So I was writing live action shows, and Hanna Barbera first hired me to write a live action uh, sitcom for them, which uh, is best forgotten. It was a pilot that never went anywhere. Um, and I met how I met Joe Barbera, and I kept saying to him, "Hey, I want to write the cartoons." And he kept saying, "Well, you know, live action writers can't write animation," uh, which was a belief they had that 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 week at the studio. And finally, um, I started writing a live action kids show for Sid and Marty Croft, one of the, uh, the many Saturday morning shows they did. And then because of that, I met all the Saturday morning executives of the networks, and I said, "Hey, I want to write animation," so they installed me. And doing it, they they gave me some ABC weekend specials to write over at ABC. They gave me a pilot to write at NBC, and uh, that's how I got into it. Which which Sid and Marty Croft did you write? Uh, well, I wrote I wrote everything Sid and Marty Croft produced for a number of years. I was like their house in house writer. The first thing I did was the Croft Superstar Hour, starring the Bay City Rollers <laughs> oh. uh, and H and R Puff and stuff and Witchy Poo and all those all the Croft characters. And wow! That that was that show was a. Uh, fast disaster, but it was on in various formats. I kept recutting them into half hours and such. It was on for many years. And then I wrote, uh, oh, what did I write next? So then the, then, then the Croft started putting me on prime time shows. I kept writing all their prime time variety specials. I wrote a, I wrote a Bobby Vinton special. I wrote an Anson Williams special. I wrote a... Pops. I wrote, a, I wrote, a, I wrote, a, I wrote the, the infamous Pink Lady and Jeff show. I was, I was writing all these variety shows for people who didn't speak English that well. <laughs> and... Uh, and I wrote, um, and later I wrote the Richard Pryor Saturday morning show for them, and uh, uh, I still talk to them. I still talk to them. I was talking to Marty Croft yesterday about doing something. You have a very diverse career. Wow, well, that's if for you sure. do enough different things, you don't do any of them well. <laughs> <laughs> people think you're, think you're think you're talented if you have a, you know, you know. People think, gee, what a long resume. He must be talented. But sometimes a long resume just means nobody's ever hired you twice. <laughs> Now you, this is Jamie, by the way, Mark. Uh, you you worked on uh, Welcome Back, Cotter, didn't you? Yeah, I was one of the. That was the first. Uh, well, that was the first staff show. I, well, no, the first show I ever worked. First TV show I worked on uh, was uh, the Nancy Walker show, and that got canceled. So I got can, I got fired after about six weeks, and Nancy got fired after about eight. <laughs> and then I wrote the McLean Stevenson show. Um, you know, enough said there. And then I wrote Welcome Back, Cotter for a year, and. Uh, yeah, that was that was one of the shows. Were, I were you responsible for up your nose with a rubber hose? And I, I was on the. I worked on the second season. By which time, all the all the catchphrases and cliches were were pretty much in place on that show. And the, the hard part of writing them was getting them out of the script, so you had room to do a story. Because at that point, every character had three three catchphrases, and if they said any time they said them, the audience would laugh for a minute and a half. So if Horshack did his three or four catchphrases and. Barbarino did three, his three or four catchphrases and such, and they all did their old catchphrases. That was a half hour. <laughs> and you had to like get them out of the script somehow. Was was, was the main the main goal? Mark, this is Shane. I have to tell you that growing up as a kid, I loved all those Sid, Sid and Marty Cross shows. I would I was glued to those recut half hour shows every day for years growing up. I, I loved Sid and Marty. One of one of the one of the the, the neat things about my career such as it is, is that I've gotten to work with a lot of people I really like. And I can draw this mental line in my head between watching shows I like and then working on the later versions of those shows or working with the same people or, or, or you know, I'm sitting there writing H.R. Puff and stuff. I was sitting there writing, you know, Witchy Poo and things like that and working with the act, same actors. And, and uh, uh, it was just, it, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of a lot of the show's I've worked on the earlier versions of that makes any sense myself. Sure, sure. Um, I also one of the Saturday morning, the Dungeons and Dragons. That was that was a mainstay for me, and I, I'm I'm dying for them to put them out on DVD in some format. Yes, I, I'm looking forward to fighting with them over money on that myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think they're out in England, and they're supposed to come out here soon. Oh wow, good. Uh, you know, so that all the people who've been buying bootlegs for years can toss them away and buy them. The official versions. When, when you when you did that show, did you have a grand scheme, or was that just a show, a week by week thing that you did? Or um, that show was a very uh, strange. There was a, a period of about five or six years there, where I was the 
I'll try to find a modest way of saying it. I was the most prolific writer of pilots for Saturday morning. I was the guy everybody went to for pilot scripts. And that particular year, I wrote, I think, three pilots, one for CBS, one for ABC, and one for NBC, all of which sold, and all of which were written in a 10-day period. Uh, the pilot for Dungeons and Dragons was written overnight. It was literally a case where, where I was writing a uh, pilot for ABC uh, for a show that I took my name off of, which shall remain nameless. It was The Littles, and uh, they, CBS called me up and they said, "We we have this show called Dungeons and Dragons. We would like to put it on the schedule, the fall schedule, but none of the scripts that have been done, none of the development that's been done, have been workable." Can you take a crack at it? And I said, I can't touch it for a couple of days. I've got to finish this pilot for ABC. And they said, when can you do it? And I said, well, I could you know, get to it next Tuesday. And they said, fine. The schedule has to be set on Thursday. You've got you know, 48 hours to, to write something. And so uh, literally I turned in the ABC script one morning, having stayed up with no sleep, drove over to CBS and started on Dungeons & Dragons. And they gave me all the material which had been done by other writers. Uh, most of the show was conceptualized by a gentleman named Dennis Marks, who deserves, I think, more credit than I do for the, the series. Uh, but what happens on a lot of these Saturday morning shows, um, and I've done a lot of pilots, uh, is they get cluttered. Um, this one, they gave me the scripts that have been done, they gave me the artwork, they gave me all this development, all these notes and things. And the show had 840 characters in it. And I said, no, this is never going to work. And I just threw characters out. And I cut it down, and I said, here's how I want to do it. And I wrote the pilot script in the Bible in two nights, and they bought the show. And, and so um, the Bible that I wrote had an overall vision, but it was a, you know, it was a, a seminal one. It was just a basic thing to start with. And then I went off. I was working on other things, so I didn't stay with the show. I wrote one more episode of it. But uh, the other people had to then take what I had as a foundation and expand upon it and ignore chunks of it. And so uh, you know, all I did was kind of give the show a shove and get it on the air. And then other people, a fellow named Hank Saroyan deserves an awful lot of credit for making the show work. Uh, he was the story editor for a season, I believe. And Steve Gerber worked on it, and Michael Reeves, and Jeff Scott, and you know a lot of friends of mine. And um, I was busy with other projects at the time where I would have done stayed with it. That's interesting. That's great. Mark, it's Jamie again. I'm I'm a huge fan for years of your point of view uh, column in uh, Comic Buyer's Guide. Uh, it was one of those where I finally I felt I found a kindred spirit, somebody who. Who knew who Stan Freeberg was? Who uh, appreciated the humor of Soupy Sales and went to Broadway shows and and did all that kind of stuff? So I just I just wanted to thank you for that. It was just you know amazing. Yeah, I, I you know it's funny. There's an awful lot of people who have like interests we intersect. But I have found that an awful lot of people I know who who like the stuff I like like all the other stuff I like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they cross connect. And every so, you know, every so often, I would get these 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 uh, letters from people who would say, "I love the columns about Soupy Sales. I love the columns about Stan Freeman. I love the column." And they they list like twenty eight different subjects I had, and they'd say, "But I really don't want you to write about Alan Sherman anymore," or something like that. They, just, they had one area that they that, that they didn't connect with me on, and they were upset about it. Yeah, that's. Um, I know you stopped doing it because of it being a weekly. Is there any thought of maybe doing it now that CBG is going to a monthly? Uh, I stopped doing it because of a fight with a publisher. Okay. And I did not know uh, that. Yeah. Uh, we had a little uh, difference of opinion that literally amounted to a penny a word. Uh, okay. And I, so they, they, <laughs> they basically lost my column for $20. Wow. And uh, I decided that I was having more fun doing uh, uh, with my website, mm -hmm. and so essentially I do the column on the website, and I just do it in, in, in a different format. I don't write long articles, I write little, you know, daily listings, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there's more immediacy, and then there's more freedom, and I don't have to, uh, you know, deal with uh, 
a publicity. They don't want me back anyway, so it doesn't really matter. That's a, that's a shame. That really, it truly is. Um, one, one of my favorite stories that you had talked about. It's the lowest paying job I ever lost, so I'm not that upset about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the uh, more interesting stories you told in your uh, in that that column was about the fourth um, artist or created you said you met Jack Kirby and how you became uh, how you uh, basically pestered him into becoming uh, his uh, answerer of fan mail and uh, no, letters no, I didn't column. Pester him at all? No, you I didn't? didn't. I thought I thought you no, said you kind no. of pestered him into it. No, never pestered Jack. You wouldn't dare. You would. You wouldn't dare pester Jack. Okay. He'd, he'd punch you out. Yeah, he was a scrapper. <laughs> well, no, you know, no, nobody made Jack do. Well, I take that back. A lot of people made Jack do what he didn't. I didn't make Jack do anything he didn't want to do. No, I met Jack in 1969. Um, it was another one of those comic club stories. Uh, he uh, uh, in the uh, July 4th weekend of 1969, it was a science fiction convention in Santa Monica, and Jack and his wife Raj showed up at it because they had, Jack had just moved to Southern California and he was trying to make contact with the comic art community. He was trying to find artists and writers out here because he had this idea of someday starting some sort of a studio or a, a company or something. And uh, he met some of our comic club members there and he invited them to his house. It was like the Bob Kane story and I, I tagged along. I was not at the convention, but he invited the comic club board of directors along and I was included. And that's how I met the man, and uh, we got to know him, and I, I worked with him on some other projects. Uh, he recommended me for a job with the Marvel Fan Club. There was a thing called Marvel Mania International that was out here in Los Angeles that was merchandising the Marvel characters, which was another one of those companies started by a guy with no money, and which is why it went under. But um, Jack saw my work there, liked it, and when he... When he uh, uh, decided that he was going to leave Marvel and go to D.C., he came by, and there was a fellow named Steve Sherman who was working there at the same time. I was running the club magazine, and Steve was doing the production of running the day-to-day the -day operation of the company, and Steve uh, and I had become friends. Jack and Roz took us to lunch at Canner's Delicatessen on Fairfax, which was later immortalized in many a Groove story in one way or another. And uh, Jack said, I'm going to work for D.C. I want you to be my one of my assistants. I went... Okay, <laughs> well, those difficult decisions to make, and uh, that was it, really. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful long association with, again, no money, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, not much money. But it was uh, uh, you, you have certain associations in your life you wouldn't trade for anything, and that was one of them. Yeah, sure, that was you know that's one of those invaluable you know friendships that you yeah. just you know, wouldn't give up for anything. Yeah, and I've been fortunate to have worked with a number of geniuses. I mean, or people who, and the word, the word genius gets tossed around a lot. So I, uh, you know, but people who uh, could be called a genius in some fashion. Uh, Stan Freeberg, you, met, you mentioned earlier, I worked, got to work with Stan a number of times on things, and, and Jack Kirby. And then you just, you know, just these people, it's, just, it's so exciting to, to be around them and to get to know them and to see how, how they operate and how they think. And, uh, Jack was one of the most, as fascinating as all the Kirby characters were, Jack, you know, never had a character that was as fascinating as the guy himself. He was just an amazing man. Speaking of geniuses, how did you and uh, Sergio get hooked up? Well, there's a segue. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying. Sergio, uh, genius, come on. Come on. If, you, if you look at, at, at Guru the Wanderer, anyway, no, uh, Sergio's a, no, Sergio is a brilliant man, and I... I I mock him because he's my best friend, and you have to mock your best friend. Um, Sergio was a guest speaker at our comic book club, the infamous L.A. comic book club again, in 1968. Uh, one of our members met him someplace, invited him to the meeting, and I met him just in passing there. Um, a year or so later, I was working for that Marvel fan club I mentioned, and Sergio came by the office and said hello, and I met him and chatted with him there. Uh, the July 4th weekend of 1970, Steve Sherman and I went back to uh, New York to the, to where I attended my first comic convention, the July 4th New York Comic Collection, run by Phil Suling. See how all these names keep popping up again in, in these narratives? In that great circle uh, of life. It's still again. And uh, we, were, we were working for the Marvel Fan Club, so we were going over to meet Stan Lee. 
and we were on Madison Avenue. Marvel's offices then were at 635 Madison. We were two hours early. We had two hours to kill before our appointment to meet Stan Lee. So we're wandering down Madison Avenue, and I suddenly heard someone yell, Mi amigos! And we look over, and it's Sergio Aragonis. And I was amazed he remembered me. But he came, comes over and says hello. And he says, oh, my friend's from Los Angeles. Good to see you. And I, he says, oh, yeah. He says, um, so uh, what are you doing in New York? And we said, well, we're going to go speak to Stan Lee, but we've got two hours to kill before our appointment. He said, ah, then I will give you a tour of the Mad Offices. And we were standing in front of the Mad Magazine offices without knowing them. We were at 485 Madison. And he takes us in this building. We were just by stupid coincidence. He was on his way there. He sees us sitting in front of the Mad Offices. He takes us in and introduces us to Bill Gaines and Al Feldstein and the whole Mad staff. And we killed two hours there and sat around with Sergio. And then... Uh, subsequently, uh, at that July 4th convention, we want, I wound up hanging out with him the whole time. Uh, just we kept finding ourselves next to each other, and, and we, you know, he was a fun person to tag along with, and we became buddies that way. My yeah. whole life is full of those it's odd a, coincidences of being in the, the right place. The you were you were place. born to be involved in comics, weren't you? I I, I fought it all the way. It, it just it just kept coming after me. Yeah. Screw Kevin Bacon, the seven degrees of Mark Evanier. Jeez. Yeah, no, no, it's about one degree. You, know, <laughs> you can link to just about anybody in the world through me these days. Mark, it's Shane again. I have to ask you, have you ever given any thought to writing a book about all these little tidbits? They are so fascinating and so well, interesting. Well, I, I thought I did that with the, I have these books out from Tomorrow's, which are collections of my POV column. That's what, that's what the column was. Okay. I had all these anecdotes, and I wanted to put them down in paper and just save them, which is how they how the columns came about, and I, um, you know, I, I keep doing them. I, I, I'm kind of a storehouse of anecdotes. And I just keep holding on to them and, and fiddling with them and such. Well, so those, those are available from Tomorrow's, you said? Yeah, Tomorrow's. There's three books, there's three volumes out. One, the first one's called uh, Comic Books and Other Necessities of Life. The second one is called Wortham Was Right, and the third one's called Superheroes in My Pants. <laughs> and if you... Look fast. I think they've got some deal where you can get the whole set for like a dollar four or something. <laughs> some <laughs> ungodly cheap price. Uh, and you, you can get them, and, and you know, they're, they make the, they're really good for like if your dining room table is a little out of kilter, you need something to put under one of the legs to balance it. Really <laughs> no, don't, don't sell yourself short. I mean, I, I, I read your, uh, your, your news for me quite often because, as you said, you, you, you write daily, but there's sometimes where you post two or three times. Um, and there are a lot of things that I've learned from every article that you've put on there, every snippet, you know, whether it's about old TV programs or someone who just passed away. Um, in the comic book industry, you're not dead until you're dead on my weblog. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what has you fired up nowadays um, as far as, you know, on your, something you just need to write about? Well, you know, I don't know. It just... The, the, the weblog is a wonderful resource because you put it out there, you hear from people. I can ask a question on my weblog, and I'll get an answer. Um, I, just, I just post a question, and somebody will, will come in. And frequently, I will post a question about um, uh, you know, some TV show, and I'll, 10 minutes later, I'll have an email from the producer giving me the answer or someone like that. Um, what fires me up about writing these days, it, it varies from moment to moment. If you look at the weblog... Some days I'm talking about politics. Some days I'm talking about Marvel Comics history. Some days I'm talking... It's the same thing I do with my friends. It's an, ex, it's an extension of, you know, what I'm talking about with my friends on the phone and such. Um, I'll, I'll talk with somebody for a while about old Marvel comic fan clubs, and I'll go to the weblog and write a piece about fan clubs. Or I'll write about politics, or I'll write about news, or whatever. It, it, the nice part of it is... It's completely free form, and and if I suddenly feel like writing about cheese, you know, blintzes, I can write about cheese blintzes. <laughs> hey, that's a topic I haven't covered. <laughs> right, better write that down. Note yes. to self: cheese blintzes. Yes. As a fan of, or I should say, you know, uh, musical theater and theater in general is is has been my life for a while. I, I really appreciate all your your Broadway reviews and things like that as well. Yeah, I just wrote a, you know, I, part of it is it's for myself. People think I'm writing for other people. You know, when I, when I write a review of a, a show I go see, it's so I can look back and read this years later and, you know, and, and go, oh, I remember that show. 
and and it's also it's fun to write things out. It's fun to express yourself, and, and also sometimes it saves it saves time. If I have an anecdote, I put it on the web log, and then I don't have to tell it to each of my friends individually because they've read it on the page. <laughs> Mass communication in one fell swoop, right? Yeah, well, it saves time. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of times like somebody has asked me a question. I say, "Go read my weblog for last Tuesday." It saves time. <laughs> uh, Mark, of, of everything you've done, I've asked this question to some other people. Of everything you've done, comic-wise, uh, and even written for for television, what's the one thing comic-wise, and what's the one thing television-wise that once Mark. Uh, you leave this mortal coil. You would like people to look, to point back on and say, "Wow, that's that's what I did." Or haven't you done that yet? Well, I would hope I'll do something better than what I've done. But you know, the, the odds the odds keep tearing on that. Um, in television, the most fun I had was writing the Garfield cartoon show for 112, you know, eight years, whatever it was. Uh, I enjoyed that show tremendously. I'm very proud of those. I, I cringe at the ones I don't like, but you know, overall. There's enough in there that I'm happy with. Uh, you, know, it, it, you do a lot of it, and TV. Uh, one of the differences between television and comics is that in comic books, generally speaking, you know, there's not as much money as television. There's a lot of limitations, but what you do pretty much reaches the audience. There's, you know, between you and the audience, there's, you know, an artist and a letterer and an inker and a colorist. It's about eight or nine people tops, and I can look at a comic book I've done and see myself, I see my expression, good, good, bad, or indifferent, it comes, they usually come out pretty much the way I want to this. There's some notable exceptions. Uh, but uh, I'm very, I have a pretty strong batting average in comics with them coming out the way I want. In television, generally speaking, you look at the finished product, and you go, oh, yeah, there's my joke there. I mean, there's the, you, you, you can't find I watch these old, you know, you mentioned Welcome Back Cotter early. I watch an old Welcome Back Cotter and I spot the three or four lines I put in in the whole half hour. The show doesn't reflect my point of view. It doesn't reflect my sense of humor necessarily. My contribution was in the same way that, you know, the, you know, the, the third baseman is proud that they won the, the baseball game because he did two, th- two or three things in the course of the, of the game. It isn't, it isn't an individual effort. In television, the one time I really felt that I had some control of the show was on Garfield, and I was very happy with that. In comics, um, the book people seem to like the most I did was a book called Crossfire that I did for some years with one of my favorite artists, Dan Spiegel. I enjoyed that tremendously. If it was a way to bring it back these days, I would do so. Uh, my other lines were going to ignore the phone, sound of the phone in the background. Um, my, the most fun I had in comics was a book that nobody read called Fanboy. That uh, you, you know you're in trouble when they send you the, the sales figures and it's just like a list of your friends' names. I, I read that. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Yeah, it was it was it was a stealth comic. There were people at DC. There, there was somebody at DC. Uh, I was up at the DC offices, and somebody stopped me in the halls and said, um, "So what are you doing on these days, Mark?" And I said, "Well, I just finished Fanboy." He said, "What's that?" I said, "It's a book." Oh, he said, "Who's publishing?" I said, "You are." <laughs> <laughs> and it was you know that was uh, I enjoyed that tremendously. We had a, we were going to do a second series of it. We had some wonderful guest artists lined up that I think would have been wonderful, and um, it just never got noticed the book it wasn't even a question of sales figures it was a question of nobody noticed it hmm. you, know, you, you know you you can you can justify keeping a book going um, even with low sales if there's some sort of buzz about it and you think oh this is going to start catching on people who read it are at least excited about it uh, this book was just just you know if a, you know, it's a, there's some variation of the anecdote about a, you know tree falls in the forest. if a comic book is published that nobody reads <laughs> doesn't make a noise. Um, and I enjoyed that book tremendously, and, and, and you know, I'm glad. And I, I, I do run into people who, 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 who read it and liked it. I think I've now, I think I've now autographed the entire press run. <laughs> well, not quite. Mine isn't <laughs> autographed yet, so next time I see you, I'll bring it along. Uh, I think, you know, um, we, we often talk about that we we as reader as comic readers we enjoy long runs of books you know several years worth at least of the same writer and the same artist yeah. and you know to get a real feel for the book and and we we you know list you know what do we think are our top 5 favorite runs or whatever and and I always put grew at the top of my list because it it's it, I think it goes beyond many other runs if it, it, for only the fact that all four of you did all the issues. I mean, how many books can you say you know for 115 issues have the same letterer? It's it's like 100 and 
146, I think. Well, if you include all the miniseries and all that stuff. We did 120 just at Marvel. We did 10 years. Oh, that's right, 120, there. yeah. And we did uh, eight at Pacific before we put them out of business. We did one at Eclipse before we put them out of business. Uh, is Image still around? We did 12 there. You know, it's just, you know, you just total them up. Um, yeah, I love that. You know, my favorite comic I mentioned earlier is The Fox and the Crow, which was written and drawn by the same guys for like 22 years. Um, a couple of times when I've gone on books, I have hoped that, that would be the book that I could do for 20 years. I would love to do a comic for 20 years. Um, in fact, I was, I was you know, talking to Paul Levitz at, from D.C. over dinner a couple weeks ago, and I said, you know, one of these days, just give me a book that nobody's interested in. Let me just stay on it for a long time. Because I would love to see if you could keep ringing different variations on the same thing. That's what I've, one of the things I like about Gru. I'm, I'm happier about doing, you know, 100 and some odd issue, 148, I think it is, or 146 issues of Gru, than if I had done, you know, the equivalent number of runs of, you know, five or six issues of other series. Because uh, I think it's interesting to keep fleshing the character out and finding new nuances and, and uh, finding new, new twists on... on uh, it's not a formula so much, it's just different aspects of the same character and different things he can do. Um, I love that kind of, kind of stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry the cobble business these days doesn't lend itself to staying on a book for a long time. I wish it did. Yeah, so do we. And when we were doing Gru, we did 120 issues at Marvel, 12, 12 a year for, for 10 years. We never missed a deadline, we never had a fill-in. And I would pick up these fanzines, and I would see people say, you know, the problem with creating our own books is they never come out on time. <laughs> I'd go, excuse me, hello. <laughs> you know, there was not a single non-creator own book that had that track record for those 10 years. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, of, course, of course, we had the advantage of having a guy who could draw an issue over lunch. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Well, right now they're 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 making uh, they're already making advances about uh, Bendis and Bagley on Ultimate Spider-Man, pushing to break. I think it's at like eighty three, eighty four, something like that. And they're looking to break the uh, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby run on Fantastic Four. And every time they announce this, usually some somebody who has you know a little more knowledge than some other people on message boards goes says, "Well, what about the Gru run?" The Gru Marvel run ran for, like you said, 120 issues, but yet nobody seems to be pushing that. Well, you know, it, 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 there's a, uh, a, lo- a long uh, argument over what's the longest run in comics. And it's, it's, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can make a case for one of, any one of a number of different things, depending on how you draw the rules up. I mean, Dick Dillon did the Justice League for you know, 8,000 years, but there was one issue in the middle by George Tuska. You know, does that disqualify him? Um, the, the thing that, that's kind of weird about this, is if you look at the, the way comics were done, the guys of the generation, of the Kirby generation, the Kurt Swan, Dick Dillon generation, they did whatever they were assigned to do that month. If, if, if Marvel had treated Jack Kirby better and paid him ultimately what they later paid everybody, uh, he would have stayed on the Fantastic Four for another 20 years. He didn't leave because he was tired of the book. He didn't leave because he was, uh, uh, you know, wanted to go off and do other things besides comics. He left because uh, they were driving him away contractually. If, um, you know, to pick a guy at around Kurt Swan, if, if DC had assigned Kurt Swan to do Superman day in, day out, no fill-ins, no t- putting him on the Legion of Superheroes for a while, no taking him off, he would have stayed on Superman for 30 years. I mean, these guys just did what they were assigned to do and, and found pleasure and fulfillment in it. But it wasn't, uh, you know, the, fa- the fact that Jack Kirby only did, you know, eight issues or 11 issues of X-Men is not because he quit the book. It's because Marvel needed him on something else, and they took him off it. Um, so it, it's a little different these days when, uh, you, know, you know, Mr. Bendis obviously has other, other options, other things he wants to do, and he, you know, he's not a full-time slave of the company. So it's a very nice, it's a very nice achievement. It's a different, it's a different kind of achievement to stay on the book that long. In the case of Gru, uh, we just enjoyed doing it. We stayed on it because we, you know, we're having fun doing it, and uh, we're going to start doing it again very soon. We've, we've taken a little hiatus here because of other things that crept into our lives. But uh, Sergio's drawing a new issue right now. Oh, that is music to my ears. Yeah, 
and, and he started about what time will we start this conversation? He should be done about now. <laughs> the issue two's out by now. <laughs> well, one thing we've been discovering through our listeners is that Gru seems to be the common denominator. We have people in El Salvador that love it here in America. I know I'm can't remember where else, but I mean, one other person. That's it. It's, it's El Salvador and here. No. <laughs> that's, about it. that's our big audience. And, and by here, I mean my house. Uh, my my maid is from my cleaning lady is from El Salvador, and she loves Gru. <laughs> she better, right? That's right. That was prerequisite. That's because I pay her in copies. Of I was going to say that's what you pay her. <laughs> Well, I fully expect a little anecdote about your little interview here. I mean, you've met Bob Kane, Jack Kirby, and now us. Yes, well, that's the big, the big three right there. That's, <laughs> there that's, you go. There's the whole history of comics. Thank you. <laughs> hey, before we let you go, I want to include you in the next bit we're going to do here. Um, we have a segment on the show called Geek of the Day, where listeners can send in uh, an, an audio recording of themselves, you know, vamping about comics for two minutes or whatever. And uh, this next one that we got uh, was sent in by... Two listeners from Texas, and uh, it's only a minute and 35 seconds. And uh, as a longtime comic fan, I know that you will enjoy this every bit as much as we will. So, uh, it sounds, this sounds like I'm in enormous trouble right now. No, 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 no. It's just good fun. So, uh, here we go. I, I hope that this will come through for you. Deep in a forest, a mind boggling attempt to destroy the Green Goliath, the Abomination, and Wendigo join forces. Alone, I. The Abomination can fight you, the Hulk, to a standstill. Together with Wendigo, we can render you helpless. Hulk, only want to fight there. After a gruesome battle, the Abomination and Wendigo leave the Hulk defeated. But suddenly... Keep away! Hulk no like people! It's okay, Hulk. We'll help you. You gotta have something to eat, Hulk. Here, have a hostess fruit fried pie. Hostess fruit fried pies? you like the real fruit filling. And how about that light flaky crust? Hulk happy now. Hulk thanks, little boy and little girl. The green gargantuan crashes off into the forest. I'm glad we had Hostess fruit fried pies to share with the Hulk. He ate them all, apple, lemon, and cherry. Now, Hulk, take care of unfinished business. In a strange way, I think he knows we're friends. You get a big delight in every bite of Hostess fried fruit pies. Now an exciting blueberry. I, when I hear, I, I listen, I pre, I screen all of these, you know, geeks of the day, and I, I just, they, the guy uh, emailed me, and he said, you know, they just, he and his buddy had a blast, um, uh, you know, mixing that they, they were, they were sound recording guys or whatever for a living, and uh, they just, they wrote out a script for a hostess ad in a comic book, and then acted it out, and I thought you'd get a kick out of that. I am moist. That's, that's how thrilled I am about that. <laughs> I hope it wasn't a. Um, that was, that, that's, uh, that's 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 quite quite um, fascinating. <laughs> You're at a loss for words. Lost for for words. once, a for writer once, who doesn't know what to words. say. It, for, for the, at the beginning, it sounded like you know a, a, a WWF wrestling outtake. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure where they were going with it. I was listening to that at my desk today at work, and I just started cracking up at the end when when they you know when they come to the punchline, and I just thought it was so funny. And you know, now an exciting blueberry. I just <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, uh, we won't waste any more of your time. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to us. It was great. Okay, great. I enjoyed it. And uh, I will send you an email right away and let you know where you can find this episode so you can uh, listen to it later or whatever you want to do. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank have you, a great Brian. day. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. That was great. <laughs> and he remembered all of our names. Yeah. That's right. He said he would. Wow. So how do you feel? This is That's, you know, half of your... I know. I, I was... When... when when I got the confirmation email from him today and his phone number and everything, I was just like totally geeking out. I'm like, oh my god, it's Mark! You know, it's, doing that Snoopy dance. Just. Oh, I know. I, well, I mean, you saw me at San Diego. Oh my lord! When I, when when he we got there on and I, 
this story goes back, but we got there on the preview night. Brian sought out Sergio and then spent a half an hour walking around deciding if he was going to go back and talk to him. <laughs> so well, finally, en masse, he, Tasha and I went back and we, we talked to him, but it, that, was, uh, that was the most nervous I've ever seen Brian. Yeah, and, and, then, you know, and then I got to talk, I mean, didn't really talk to Mark, but when I, when I, after the panel and I went up and had Mark sign the group page that mm-hmm. I bought, you know, I was just like, oh man, and then there's Stan Sakai, and then there's Tom Luth, and I'm just like, oh my god, it's all four of my favorite people on earth, you know, and it just, it was so cool, you know, so that was a, an ult- this last an hour has been uh, a great geek out moment for me. Cool. Yes, he was very to... entertaining, very interesting. The I... guy knows everybody. Yeah. Uh-huh. I can't believe Unbel- that. It, yeah, it, I, I definitely Ooh. recommend getting those. Uh, I'm gonna. POV. I'm, I didn't. I didn't yeah. realize they were from tomorrow. So no, I, like, I didn't either. Should have told him. Well, you know, we just talked to John. I mean, this like it all comes together. You know, <laughs> it's, on, it's on the back of one of those magazines. Yeah, I don't even. How did I miss that? I don't know. Uh, that's yeah, crazy. I, actually, I think Tomorrow's also did the Peter David one. The but I the but I digress one. Did they too. really? I could, I, could, I could be wrong one, but I, I thought they did. That might have been CBG. Here but, they are. He's uh, got them on his websites. Yeah, they're, they're, I they're definitely, definitely have to look them up. up. Gosh, Sergio actually had those on his uh, on his table when we did were. Did he? Yeah. Man, how, I was totally. I was in a daze. You're too, too geeking out. I swear to yeah. God, yeah. I was, well, after the money you dropped on that page. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true too. Yeah, yeah. there's no money left. Yeah, but in the you know what? There's some things that are just worth it. <laughs> oh yeah. Because yeah, he would have kicked himself had he walked oh, yeah. away from Absolutely. that. But there was no that. one. Even even as he told me the price. And I said, "Wow, it's too much." I knew in the back of my head, "I'm leaving with one." Yeah, yeah. What the hell, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, had it been the last day, you might have been able to talk yourself out of it. But yeah, but on, on the, the first, first day, day no. <laughs> no way. No. First of five days, yeah, you have four more days to think about it. So you had four more days to convince Tasha that it was the right thing to do. She's the one who actually convinced me. Yeah. So I. We should give out his website. It's www.povonline.com. Correct, right? Yeah. And, and uh, newsfromme.com. Right. He ha- he just has. Everything he talked about and more yep. is on that site. Every day. Every something. day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I love, you know, we talk about the guys who, who, who know the business and know the history and know the industry. He is always putting up something on there that I go, wow, I did not know that. Yeah. So. And high praises for that Gerard Jones book, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's... I'm going to have to sit down and read my copy of that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, one thing he didn't get, I mean, he's, he's, he was t- just tell stories about, you know, like I said, Stan Freeberg, you know, guys, people that I knew. I mean, I know you guys in here probably have no idea who Stan Freeberg is, but um, I mean, he he talked about when Groucho Marx was on was on Welcome Back, Cotter, and how that was a big you know deal for him to actually meet Groucho Marx because he loved all the Marx Brothers movies. He's one of his favorite movies is also one of my favorite movies. Is it's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> um, he had a great article about that meeting Mickey Rooney and how Mickey Rooney hates that movie and how you know he's like he thought that was good that was a piece of crap i hated that movie and like he's like well, how can you hate that movie it was great just anecdotes and i'm, I'm really hoping fingers crossed that uh, this new york convention will be big enough to get him because he usually likes an excuse to come out to the east coast and maybe this will be big enough that they'll be able to get him to come out. We can. Well, then I'm bringing my fanboy issues. Yeah, we can talk to him. <laughs> I think I even have an issue or two. I that. think that's even traded. It I is. Think. Oh yeah, yeah it's it definitely is. traded. Yeah. It's definitely traded. There's it a lot it, of the it was creators funny. that were involved in that too. Yeah. A lot of famous, you know, other famous artists and stuff. You know, and, so. and that's a new trade. That's not something that's been out for a while. That's that was just like at least the late eight, 90s, right? Oh, I think they even resolicited yeah. it before. I, I thought I, I don't remember yeah, when fanboy was. came out in the late 90s. So yeah, right, about, okay. right around or maybe even 2000. It was right around so. the time they did the Sergio destroys the Marvel universe and Sergio <laughs> destroys the DC universe and all that kind of all that fun stuff. Yeah, because I remember they 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 would have like. They did the classic Kevin Maguire Justice League number one yeah. cover with him in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Cool. And and it's worth getting out. I, I totally forgot about Crossfire, but you know that that was kind of like a, a, a blink. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it was the here and gone, but it was a. Uh, yeah, that was it spawned a, out of DNA agents, and it was just a really good book. Whenever you talk about some of the, the quintessential independence of that era of the 80s usually crossfire pops up somewhere along the lines mm-hmm. never got a chance to really read any of them i have some of the dna agents but i never read any of the crossfire i've always heard they're good you know what i think is interesting is a lot of these creators that we've talked to say they've been reading comics for as long as they can remember yeah. they don't remember what their first issue was they don't remember how old they were mm-hmm. you know it's no wonder they're creating comics because they 
have been barraged, lived, lived and breathed yeah. comics yeah. their entire lives. Hopefully that's what my son is. I, I started him in every every week he gets a new comic of some kind. So it was in the cra- in the cradle in the yeah, crib. Yeah. That's like, yeah. <laughs> he had a he had a Batman beanie right there, yep. man. Firstborn. Here you go. Cool. Did you find the fanboy or were you looking or you're not looking at Yeah, the, the, the fanboy is on Amazon. It says it was published uh, October uh, August first, two thousand one. So the the comics might have come out in two thousand. Yeah, cool. I kind of re- think that's. I think I was dating Tosh at the time. It's not up on in stock trades. It might be. I didn't look. Yeah, maybe check it out. Well, you, you know, want me to type that in right now? Sure. You All know right. the one the You're one right thing there at the keyboard that I have to do is is definitely cut back on toys and stuff because all these people we talk to i want even more so than just hearing you guys talk about them people that i haven't read or 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 had an interest in after talking to them hearing about them listening to them it it sparks something you want to learn more you want to see what they're talking about Mm -hmm. i i i mean for me it's really almost to a certain extent where i'm listening to it like our listeners where they're going and buying this stuff on our recommendation even me i'm i'm going and and taking interest in all this new stuff that i never would have thought to do it's it's just incredible i'm i'm amazed yeah check out a site i'm telling yeah. you that you will learn so much about the man it's mm. great is it up yeah it's uh, $8.42 at instock trades oh. there you go and well worth every penny yeah it's it's, it's fun. humorous shoot that thing up to number 1 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a truly comic book right yes actually which is always yeah if you're a fan of of it's not as ir- irreverent as like Ambush Bug or, but if you're a fan of like you know Ambush Bug and Amazing Man and and Gru, Gru and you know it's it's all along that line. Mm-hmm. That's great. I want to give a shout out to Bruce Rosenberger for his Comics Cast episode 14, where he actually talks about us a little bit. He talked. He. Uh, I have that he, downloaded. Uh, yeah. He I didn't put it to my iPod yet. Loved the Denny O'Neill interview. Um, he did go on to read Fables Volume 2. I believe he even sent us something, which I'm sure maybe we'll play eventually. Um, you know, speaking of that, Fables Volume 2, I was at the comic book store in Bethlehem, which is very near to where I work, and it's the one that Bruce shops at. Okay. And and they knew that he bought Fables Volume 1 because he bought it from there, the owner and his girlfriend. And they were invited to his birthday party, so they're the ones who actually gave him Fables Volume 2 as the owners of the comic shop, so that's pretty cool. Oh. Yeah. He said he enjoyed it. Um, but uh, he gave a shout out to us, so I'm going to make sure you know we do in the return as well. Check it out, uh, comicscast.lipson.com. Bruce Rosenberger puts out a really cool podcast, so check him out. I guess obviously he liked it enough that I don't have to buy it for him. So <laughs> yeah, I think he so gave it like a, there. a four, four point five volume two. So. I just, I, yeah, I told you that second one was good. Uh, and the second shout out I want to give is for the person who gave me in my mailbox today uh, how to be a superhero by dr metropolis your complete guide to finding a secret hq hiring a sidekick thwarting the forces of evil and much more <laughs> it's a cool little <laughs> i've seen that in bookstores it's kind of like you know like how to survive a disaster or you know some of those the worst things. case scenarios. worst case yeah. scenarios thank you it's kind of along those lines it's like it's like a mock batman guide that scott Beatty wrote and it's really kind of cool so i'll be reading that <laughs> and checking that out I've always wanted to pick up. They also have like a companion, how to be a super villain. I always wanted to get that one. <laughs> I could see you as a super villain. Yeah, I, I, I could too. I could too. Put you in like a, a some kind of suit or something, or that. some sort of you know purple, maybe. I don't know. We have a something. monocle. So what are we doing? Yeah, a monocle. monocle. I see a monocle. Yeah, well, what are we doing tonight, brain? <laughs> but he doesn't want to dress up for no, Halloween. No, no, I mean, he, he could put on a white tux and be or a white suit and be the kingpin or or dr I'm faustus you get a red mustache i don't glasses. dress up for halloween i don't like as he halloween. sits there with a napoleon dynamite shirt that i got for and, my well, birthday from brian thank uh, you very yeah, much yeah. and he 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 uh wore the a geek not want to dress up to he a, wore the charlie brown shirt that one time it's yeah that charlie was brown. that was the one and only time <laughs> i dressed up for your party uh we got uh uh an email from the guy who does the pixelstrips.com website that we um pimped out a couple episodes ago he uh he decided to lower his subscription costs so if you were on the fence about um, subscribing but you decided to not do so well now's your time it's two bucks for a month ten dollars for six months and only eighteen dollars for an entire year so that's you, pretty you can't buy one comic for two bucks a month unless you're buying like powerpuff girls yeah that's true 
So all those comics, two bucks, well worth it. Yeah. What are you making faces at, Peter? Because my headphones got caught and I almost Uh-oh. pulled my head. <laughs> Jeez. I was like, Jesus. I'm going nuts right here because there was something I'm trying to remember that I'm supposed to talk about on this episode. I know what it is. Just let's keep going. Do some Stump the Rios. Are you sure you know what yeah. it is? Do Stump the Rios. Are you sure? Trust me. <laughs> I don't Because I don't remember talking to you about it. No, that's oh, different. That's not, oh, no, 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 no. It's something else. He's got secret. Yeah, there was something. Let's read his brain. Damn it. Well, we'll do, I'll do a Stump the Rios. I don't have the music queued up, so let me just find one here. By the way, people, we're we're running a little low on Stump the Rios, so uh, if you want to send one in, we could use it. Need to restock the gun. <laughs> Maybe we need to offer a bit, bit bigger prize. Maybe that's what it is. Or a prize. Hey, well, Matt's we got half, still, the, half got of them up there, man. <laughs> oh, he's got identity disc. I, identity, <laughs> that's what it, identity disc, that's what I meant. Oh, we want them to send stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> Not scare them. Not away. run screaming, <laughs> mad. <laughs> Here's one uh, from Billy Beechler. He says, I just He's list- the one who did the Uncle Scrooge ones. He says, I just listened to the Baltimore wrap-up and had the pleasant surprise of hearing my email and trivia questions read. I'm sorry that I caused Peter to become so sullen by my questions. I am a huge fan of both Carl Barks and Don Rosa and feel their comics are truly all ages perfection, much like Stan Lee's early Marvel work. They are complex, compelling stories which never talk down to the audience. And if you know Donald Duck just from the old Disney cartoons, you don't know the comics Donald. Barks reinvented uh, Donald's personality as the hothead from the cartoons could never sustain multiple comic stories. It would have gotten boring very fast. Anyway, thanks Jamie D for the defense of the questions. You got it. As a way to make up, make it up to Peter... Here are three superhero-only questions. Number one. Watch, I'm going to tank. <laughs> yeah. Peter David had a fantastic run on Spectacular Spider-Man in the 80s. One of his best-remembered stories is the death of Gene DeWolf. Who killed this New York police captain and friend of Spidey? The Sin Eater. Okay, that's not what he has now, as an answer. Oh, does he have a real name? Yeah, he says, fellow police officer, Sergeant Stan Carter. Dressed as the Sin Eater. Anybody remember that? Well, yeah, it was, it was, Kevin it when was, we need it him. was Sin Eater, yeah. but I, I didn't know his real name. Right. Okay. Question two. J. J. Jonah Jameson finally tied the knot in Amazing Spider-Man Annual 18, written by no other than Stan the Man Lee himself. Of course, no Marvel wedding can happen without a supervillain disruption. Which baddie did the deed this time? Scorpion. That is correct. Woo-hoo. You look like <laughs> you just pulled, pulled it right out of that your that buttocks. Was, that was, uh, they teamed up early on, so I figured if anybody's going to come back in a pivotal moment of Jonah's life, it's going to be a scorpion. Yeah, because... Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Right? Was yeah, it, was well, it, yeah, he, he basically, uh, I thought, paid for the scorpion suit type thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, question number three. Depending on the story you're reading or watching... Clark Kent has had two middle names. What are they? Oh, it's, um... No, wait. Clark is Martha's maiden name, right? So that's not going to help me. Clark... Clark Jonathan Kent or Clark uh, Thomas Kent? They just they just said his middle name on the TV show because Ma in one of the uh, one of the last couple episodes just said Clark blah 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 Kent and I can't remember what he said. <laughs> it's pretty stinking obvious. Looking at the answer, Clark, two two different middle names, two different middle names. for Superman, two names associated with Superman. <laughs> Clark Kal-El Kent. <laughs> George Sorry. and Christopher? Oh, yeah, okay. No, no, no. No? Bigger than that. Jerry oh, and uh, Jerome, yeah, and Jerome and Joseph. And Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. So. There you go. Thanks, Bill. And so, like, would you... So you got, uh... You got one wrong. Right. You didn't say the Stan Carter, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, I didn't know he wanted the real name or the... 
You got the Shiznit pimp back up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was Sin Eater. I'm going nuts here. My my brain is like, what? Uh, maybe <laughs> it's I just really wanted to remember to do the the uh, that hostess thing. Don't know. I don't know. Did anybody send anything else in that you want to play that you need to play or no? No. Oh, what the uh, phone number? I can announce that. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> got so serious, you pointed Ooh. at me and everything. <laughs> that's good. We now have a uh, an audio comment line that you can call and leave voicemails for us. Which we, if you don't, if you don't have the the technology to record. Um, uh, a Geek of the Day, you could actually call into this number and leave a message for the Geek of the Day. Um, so that number is 206-888-4805. Uh, leave a voicemail, and the ones that we like will play on the air. We're not going to promise to play all of them because we got in trouble with the emails. Uh, what was that number again? 206-888-4805. Start dialing now. <laughs> yes, boys and girls, you too can leave a message for the CGS crew. That's good. That's good, but I don't. I still don't think it's what I had in mind. But What's funny is that screw is it, that, I, I can't remember. I was talking to LT of I Read Comics, and I said, "Yeah, we got this cool thing. You know, da 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 da. You know, they record uh, messages, blah blah blah." She goes, "Yeah, every podcast does that." <laughs> I said. Well, yeah, you know what? Well, now it's going to be big because we're doing it. Well, I mean, I know, like, Dawn and Drew is, you know, a podcast I listen to all the time, and they're a very big podcast. And um, they have an audio comment line, and they've had it since the since I first started listening. And it's 206-something-something-something. Something. And this company is in Seattle, I think, and all their phone numbers are in that area code. And so when I, when I got it and I signed up, and it's like, oh, it's 206 that must be where Don and Drew get their line from. It's like, <laughs> duh, you know. But I just never knew about it. Right, right. I always thought, well, they pay for a voicemail box and they somehow route it to their phone. And I'm like, I, if you don't know, you don't know, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I knew other people did it. I just didn't know how they did it, and it's free, so I didn't want to pay for any, uh, you know, voicemail. Now I don't have to. So there you go. And uh, speaking of Don and Drew, we we're gonna uh, try something else. They have been doing lately uh, a bit where. If listeners will email them their phone numbers if they want them to give them a call. While they're recording, they just randomly pick one of the people who sent in a phone number, and they try calling. And if they're not home, they leave a message. And if they're home, they talk to them for like two minutes, and then they hang up, and it was just cool to hear yourself on the show. So we figured that's a good idea. We'll do it too. So if you want us to maybe call you, send us... uh, your phone number in uh, in an email, just with the subject line of you know call me, and uh, then I'll know that that's one of those, and maybe you'll get a call, maybe you won't. You know, if we get thousands of them, then you know it could take a long time <laughs> till your number comes up, and then you may not be home. But it's kind of fun. We'll leave a message. Yeah. Now, did we get the remember the guy the one bullet short? Did we get his information? Who won the um, letter column title contest? No. We have not gotten his because information. Technically, he really should be the first person, you know. That we well, that's him. a whole special thing where he's going to yeah. be on for the whole show. True, but this but, is uh, just for like two minutes. So one bullet short. If you're listening, you know we haven't seen you on the forum, and, and we still need you know your info because your prize is you're going to be a guest on one of our shows. So maybe that's why he's in hiding. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he doesn't want to be on the show. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. I think finally I finally remember. remembered. I saw the light bulb. We vamped long enough. <laughs> Woo! I got another. Um, Postcard. Is that it? Which is very cool. And nobody yeah, can see. Settle kidding, down. Kidding. Hot that, no, shot. that no one can see. No, I'll be scanning it and putting it on the website by the time hey, you. Speaking of that, not to interrupt you, but um, the Which Baltimore fans anyway. are dying for the Baltimore pictures. Where are they at? Whose camera? Oh, hell. I have to put them up. Didn't I put them up? No. Yeah. <laughs> I check every day and I haven't seen really? them. Really? I've gotten uh, a few private messages. Um, hey, where are the Baltimore pictures? Crap. And where are the dog pictures? I said, well, I know. I have, I have to put up a lot of fan art pictures, too, because those yeah. guys on the message board are yeah. drawing faster than I can keep track of. <laughs> you know, man, which is good. I'm not complaining, but I have to, you know, just get my act together and sit down with Photoshop and resize everything. But th- this uh, postcard is from Jeremy in Utah. So that was cool. And then I got an actual letter wow. from uh, a guy in Australia. 
We have a lot of Australian fans. It's kind of cool. We'll have to go visit there. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, oh, yeah. speak English down there? <laughs> we're, we're going by boat because I ain't taking off no airplane out of Australia. That's all I got to say. <laughs> you wouldn't want to fly down there? No, no I'm... Uh, well, that's only know, going that's, to L.A. That's, that's lost. That's what I'm telling you. They took off from yeah, Australia. From and that's Australia where they're going to head to L.A. Well, if you go the other way. Yes, yeah, if, yeah. if we go towards the fly the long way. <laughs> towards the west, I should say. Um, this is from... I'm going to read this because it, it's pretty cool. It says, Dear Brian, Shane, Kevin, Jamie, and Peter. Uh, I was just listening to your show. I'm a Kirby fan, and I got an email from the Tomorrow's people saying that John Morrow was being interviewed on your program. I'm a comic book fan, and despite the fact I don't get to read them as much as I used to, I will always be a fan... I learned to read from comics. I hope that comics never become acceptable as I like them because they are on the fringe. Mainstream has killed Shakespeare and Dickens. It was only after I graduated from school that I realized that the classics had once been popular with normal people and not just out-of-touch English teachers. Anyway, I understand that one of you collects stamps. I'm an American living in Australia, so here are some Australian stamps. He sent me a whole bunch of canceled Australian stamps. I saw those out there on your Which is so awesome. So this is from Todd, uh, which, uh, Todd, I love it. Thank you so much. It was great. I loved getting the stamps. You know, plus it had a stamp on the envelope, which was a very cool stamp, too. So, yeah, our first official fan letter. Yeah, yeah an yeah. actual handwritten letter. Cool. That's what always, that's what always makes me laugh, though. One of, the, one of the, the points he made about Shakespeare and all that kind of stuff was people look at Shakespeare now and are like, oh, I can't understand Shakespeare, blah, blah, blah. They don't realize that Shakespeare is written right, for, for the, the dummies. common man, yeah. Uh, not dummies, but for the, the common man. That was the, one of the lower forms of entertainment in its time, and now we consider it one of the higher forms of entertainment. And that's because the language has changed so much. I personally, I love to read it. It sounds beautiful. I have absolutely no friggin' idea what happens in any Shakespeare play from reading it. I just don't understand it. My brain does not process it. Well, the I, the I only one it. I got I was them. Hamlet. I, I could understand what was going on in that. Some of the other stuff we touched on in English class. <laughs> it was so funny. I sat next to a kid in my senior year who was like a CD student. He was a cool guy. He was a good friend of mine. Got along well. You know, English class, he would never pay attention. He would never read the books. He would just multiple choice out his ass guess. And, you know, usually you could pass by guessing right enough, you know. We got to, we did King Lear senior year. He read it. He knew everything that happened. He was having these in-depth discussions with the teacher in class about, you know, he's answering all the questions, raising his hand constantly. I'm sitting there, the straight-A student. I'm like, I'm a fucking idiot. I don't understand this. I'm reading it. I'm looking at it. I got the cliff notes. I still don't know what the hell's going on. I'm like, how is this possible? I don't understand. I mean, I agree. It sounds beautiful. Oh, I could read it all day. Just don't expect me to have any idea what goes on. Something's just click. I mean, it's one of those, That's funny those about stories that. just clicks. Uh, for me, Shakespeare, I love uh, Macbeth. That's my favorite of all the stories. And that, for some reason, that, that story just clicked with me. I just, and still does. I'll, I'll go see it. I'll watch it. Anytime I, anytime I see it being performed, I will try to make sure I go Is see Macbeth it. Is Macbeth the one with the double bubble do- toil and trouble, yeah. the witches or whatever? Yeah, it starts out with the witches. And I, I saw a performance of that somewhere on stage can't remember some college was doing it or something or some uh, theater group i don't know you know i sat in the audience watching the people i don't know what's going on <laughs> i'm even watching them i still don't know what's going on i love that that the uh uh hamlet by uh mel um mel gibson mel gibson yeah. i love it it's beautiful it's directed nice the settings are awesome and yeah. it's acted perfect I have no idea what happens. <laughs> I've seen it like six times. I have the laser well, that's disc. that's not their fault, then. <laughs> I have no idea. I so, couldn't even tell you. Something about his father. That's all I know. So I have a question. So you actually like theater a lot, just not musicals. Right. I love... I was just... Clarifying. I enjoy... I, 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 I would... With more practice, because I know that I'm not especially good, but I enjoy being on stage. I enjoy doing accents and acting dramatic and all that stuff. I think it's great. Yeah. And I used to beg and plead every year... With the uh, with the people who did the, the school play, I'm like, can it not? Can it be a play? Must it be a musical? Can it just be a play? And they're like, no. Well, people like musicals, but but just because you have a guy who sings doesn't mean he can act. 
So it's always the biggest roles go to the people who have the best voice, and half the time they're the worst actors. And it's like, I could sort of act a little better than these guys. Give me a bigger role. But all the roles have singing. So senior year, I was in Camelot, and I was Merlin. Because Merlin doesn't sing. He has no songs. He's in the first scene, and a small little bit in the second scene, and that's it. And then, because I was bored and wanted something else to do, later and they made me Lancelot's assistant, and I got to speak in a crazy French accent and make the entire audience laugh. The only people part of the whole play, anybody remembers, is when the Lancelot's squire comes out and says, that's me. You know, nobody remembers a goddamn thing about the play except for that. You know? But no, they wouldn't. I want to do, let's do 12 Angry Men. Oh, we can't do that. Why not? Yeah, you're perfect What are you, for what are you telling me, Arthur Miller can't write? <laughs> now, tell me I couldn't be in 12 Angry Men. I could see you doing Shakespeare. Exactly. I would have loved to do Shakespeare. I can memorize. I can read those lines with with effect. You just got to tell me what it's supposed to mean. I cast him in a Shakespeare role that had to sing. I really make him sweat. <laughs> I had people the old singing, all dancing Shakespeare. There, you know, there are a lot that sing. And I have two good Shakespeare experiences. One is when I was doing when we were doing that comedy thing. I remember the night that the poetry group was yeah, there or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody from the poetry group came up to me and said, "You should read Shakespeare for a living." You should do Shakespeare. You have the voice and the whatever. I'm like, oh, well, thank you. I don't even know who you are. Thank you. This is a nice gesture. Okay. And a couple years ago, Tash and I were on a date. We went to, with some friends, we went to the Renaissance Fair. And, you know, you pick all the, there's a bunch of things going on. You pick which ones you want to go to. So we decided to go to this thing at the Globe, you know, Shakespeare's sure. stage. Or, I'm like, all right, this sounds interesting. Let's do this. Well, it ends up being its audience participatory. They pick some people and they pick like three group, three sets of people a guy and a girl and they give you a piece of a play to act out so i said yeah i'll raise my hand what the hell i'll be in this so luckily enough they picked me because you know there's 20 people raising their hands so they picked me okay i go up and i have to do romeo and juliet and they have a little script for you you know and i have to get down on my knee and i have to you know do the lines or whatever the, the the gimmick is that there's Shakespeare's assistant, this woman is on stage, and Shakespeare walks out into the into the aisles to be with the people to hear their reaction to his great words or whatever. And and she like whispers some changes to me. So she changes some word to some ridiculous word, you know, uh, something so the the moon becomes a, 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 a an acorn or something like that, you know, and, and she just to to surprise Shakespeare and make him shocked. Well, this was right after I got done doing the comedy thing, so I'm used to now doing improv comedy, right? I was like, oh, I'm in the groove. So I get up there, and I'm reading, and I say the line, and Shakespeare goes, what, 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 stop, 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 and the assistant's going, blah, 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 blah. Okay, keep reading. Well, then I changed a bunch of more lines to go with the acorn theme on the fly. I had the the oak tree and the something else, a squirrel, I don't know, whatever. And everybody is friggin' laughing in the audience. And after they do the three sets of people, the audience has to clap by who they think should win the contest. And I ended up winning the contest. And the guy who played Shakespeare, as we were leaving the thing, he had to go off to another section. He passes me and he says, hey, dude, you know, it's not cool to be a professional actor and be up there. And, you know, this is supposed to be for novices. I'm like, I'm a f- freaking computer programmer i've only been on my high school play what are you talking about so apparently me and shakespeare got something going on but i just don't understand any of it <laughs> i'll remember that 10 hour story when i have to tell a story about broadway and you want to turn my <laughs> mic down you bitch <laughs> all right you're just jealous no, mr no. actor <laughs> I enjoy Shakespeare, and then the best part about it is the stage fighting and the kissing and all that stuff. So you've got to be an actor these days. Great. I begged in Camelot because Merlin is seduced by Namu, right? And and the girl who played Namu was the hottest girl in school. <laughs> And there's no kiss, but she lures me seductively off stage, and she's doing this sultry dance and, like, touches me and, like, pulls away, and I have to follow, like, I'm hypnotized. And I'm like, the, my English teacher was the director. I'm like, you got to make me kiss her. <laughs> I think there needs to be a kiss, at least on the cheek, you know? And she's like, it's not, I'm like, come on. It's dramatic. you got to do it. And she You're the director. Like, you can do whatever That's you right. want. You Just can like... write that in there. No one will ever know. Why do you think I used to do theater when I was in high school? Because girls are dropping, you know, Changing her clothing in the wings and oh, yeah. to kiss everybody. Yeah. I was like, got that right. Bus I never, yeah. got, to, wings I never got to kiss her. Yeah. Michelle Nearly, if you're listening. Oh, oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, you know the Michelle Uh-oh. Nearly I story. Did you really? Yes. 
We did Godspell. We here. Tell me she wasn't hot. She was. She's and beautiful. And so nice. Oh my God, I picked her. And that her. voice, that high. <laughs> No, oh, we're just talking totally two degrees of Peter right now. Oh my God! Yeah, I never got to kiss her. So I did. Yeah, you bitch. <laughs> it all comes around to Peter kissing somebody. That's all. Uh, that's fine. Right. You see, the problem is you had to go to a school that actually had a play and a musical, right. like Muhlenberg did. Muhlenberg had both, so I got to do yeah. both. Yeah, Boyertown had, had a drama club that would do plays. Yeah, that was musicals. the problem. I can't I believe that. so weird they said that name. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, she was way be- she gorgeous. Was, she, was, she was beautiful. Mm. Was or is? I, I haven't seen her in a long time. I haven't time. seen her for I a while. I think she's even married now. Everybody out there is probably uh, bored is, silly she's right married. now. <laughs> Dated her for two weeks. They've turned off once we hit the Shakespeare stuff. Dated her for how long? <laughs> two weeks. I did two a show weeks. with... I thought right, you said yeah. two years at first. I was like, <laughs> I didn't know that. Was I would have known you then. It's one of those hot... Those hot, uh, hot pass in two weeks. She two just weeks. got off of dating some guy for the longest time, and I was oh, heading to rebound. college in two weeks, and she was heading back to college, and, and she, she... College? Yeah, she, oh, so she was, this was after high school? Yeah. Oh, okay. But I, she went to my junior high school. Really? She went to Northwest Junior High before she went to Holy Name. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the fans are totally bored right I now. I know. <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> loving it. So We'll put a picture up of her and you won't be bored anymore. Oh, do you have pictures? <laughs> I have pictures. Oh, because, yeah, I don't have any pictures. I but I have the you. tape of me in Camelot. I haven't watched it ever since I graduated. Can at... we do a commentary on that? Oh, boy. <laughs> and just a reminder that this episode was... Sponsored by E. Gerber Products, the industry leader in long-term storage sleeves for your collection. You can visit them online at www.egerber.com. E. Gerber Products, the protector for the collector. And now I'll go through my usual closing litany. Uh, if you want to send us an email, you can do so comicgeekspeak at gmail.com and visit us on the web at www.comicgeekspeak.com. And be sure to join our forum. We have over 400 people now actively posting, and it's it's a really fun community. Uh, thanks to Bob at GameCircuit.net for hosting all the show files. And thanks to the guys at UpAllNightGaming.com for hosting the website. Vote for us at Podcast Alley and subscribe to us using iTunes. And if you would like, you can get a T-shirt for only 10 bucks. That includes shipping uh, off of our website. Special thanks to Mark Evan Year for his interview. Yes, a man of many talents. And uh, once again, we're brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. See you next time.